Hi, are you someone like me that's so passionate about food that you went down the rabbit hole and started homesteading? That's me, my name is Jonathan, and I'm after the best ingredients so much that I bought a farm. And we're here today to talk about pigs. So these are the five things I wish I knew, plus one bonus one you're gonna wanna stick around for, that I wish I knew before I got into homesteading. So things to know about our, uh, our piggy friends while they frolic off in the pasture where they're not supposed to be. First thing is just the level of destruction that they're capable of. They can absolutely wreak havoc on land if you're not prepared. And it's very important that we are spending the time to keep them on rotation and moving them around. I'll show you some of like where their uh, holdup pin is from the holidays where we were out of town. We kind of secured them up in a tighter space. And you'll see the level of destruction they had. Again, the videos will show you that there's, there was plenty of grass and everything out here. And then with over time, they root all of it up. They'll make wallows in it. They love to get the water uh, mashed into it. And the next thing you know, you've got little mini puddles everywhere. And it, Stinks to high heaven. But what we have done with pigs though is use that destruction for our favor. So these pigs, they're not bad creatures when it comes to destruction. We just need to harvest that destruction to do good things for our farm. So what can what are things that we need that destruction for? Uh, things like um, breaking up the ground and getting things ready for harvest. Uh, in our last farm, we took over property that it had sat empty for two years. It was a bank-owned property, and a lot of the area was just overgrown. And so what we did is we basically allowed the pigs to be pigs, or as Joel Salatin says, be the marvelous pigness of pig. And we let them do all the hard work for us. So that meant that they ate a lot of the grass out, they tilled it all up for us, and they did a lot of the work that later became our garden in the spring. If you need land leveled off, they're a great creature to use for that. You can't see it, but if you drive through here with a car, there's actually humps that come through here from the row crops. So I'm actually wanting the pigs to kind of use in their snouts, root that up and level this land out. It's a great natural way to, to do work on your land without having to break your back. I'm not quite the, uh, the young stud I used to be. And uh, so having that as a way to help. I can't afford a tractor. I can't afford to come out here and do it myself. So having an animal that comes out and just naturally does it for me, is, uh, it's, a great, it's a great thing to have. And at the end, it's, it's bacon, it's pork chop, prosciutto, whatever it might be. So understanding what that pig can do for you on your farm, I think is key. Putting them in uh, just a confined pen, yes, you can do it, and yes, it can work. I think there's an ecological impact that we'll have, and we have to be very careful of that. And again, I, I feel like I kind of pushed my, my realm of comfortability a little bit on it. I've seen much worse, but I've definitely seen a lot better. And um, I think they can just be a great impact on our farm if we allow them to naturally be who they are and take care of them, how we as good stewards of the earth as God has asked us to be, uh, if we allow them, if we do that role, we allow them to do their role. But when I talk land management, this is kind of what I'm talking about though. Like they were just in here for too long. So they rooted all this up, got water everywhere, you know, potentially could have damaged the barn, you know, the old coop that's out here. And again, this will all heal back up over time. I'm not too worried about it. We're just gonna rest it up. This was grass up to like here. So I'm not, you can see a couple pieces still, you know, up to my, up to my face. But this is the destruction kind of they're capable of. Notice there's not really any real blade of grass left. So it's kind of important that we allow the pig to be the pig. And so I'm opening up this extra space for them. And then again, we're kind of expanding out. Next is understanding the amount of feed that they need. They could potentially be the most expensive livestock to have on your homestead. And they require, these six eat a 50 pound sack every day when they were in this area because there was nothing else to eat. So they're solely focused on this. Two days ago, I filled this hopper. See, it's still almost at the, the, the heaping top. So by allowing the pig to just be a pig, We've greatly eliminated a lot of our feed cost for our pigs. 
And so they're eating about 50 pounds less in two days by just having all this open grass. So I'm a little debated on whether or not I'm just going to let them have the pasture or if I'm going to bring them back into this confined space. I'm going to go ahead and repair it. That way, in case we got to go on a trip or anything like that, we've got this confined area that we can put them into. And then, uh, of course, when it's time for butcher, it's a lot easier to catch them when you're in a confined area than it is to be free chasing them around a three-acre pasture. But understanding their fee cost is, is a, it's a big part of it. And it can really rack it up the cost of your, your farm. Now, I'm sure they grow faster on that feed. I'm not going to deny that. I know lots of that's pretty much the model for most, you know, major pork producers is, you know, slat feed in front of them 24-7, let them eat. Uh, but here they might grow a little bit slower and it might take me two more months to grow a natural pork product. But I think I'm going to have a higher quality. I'm going to have better marbling. And then when I get down into the last month, I'll start focusing in on some of those uh, the grains and things to make sure that I'm getting the marbling that I'm going to need inside of the pork. Plus, I'm going to play a few tricks up my sleeve when it comes to getting lard into my actual pork chops and things of that nature. Understand the intelligence of these pigs. These pigs are by far the smartest creatures on my farm, maybe only second to my dogs, and that might be questionable most days. The pigs will watch how you put things together. They'll watch how you open doors. Uh, we originally had a latch door. They learned how they can move the latch and get out. We had zip ties that we're using to hold a couple things together as some temporary fixes. I got lazy and left my temporary fix out there for too long. They realized with their teeth they can bite down, break that zip tie, and be out in the big pasture. So understand that they are highly intelligent, not just in escaping. They're highly intelligent on where they poop. They Like for us, they've only pooped like back here in this back corner. I find that kind of cool that they understand some level of sanitation, I guess, for a livestock. But they're very unique in their intelligence and understanding of what's going on around the farm. They recognize the sound of my car. I'm about 100 yards away from my drive. But they recognize my car, and they, they see me, and they get really excited. They think, hey, it's, it's feed time. It's, I highly recommend, if you've got the money, having these hog panels around their entire area. I know others that do electric wiring. I didn't have the money option for that this year. This is kind of a low budget year for us. We had a bad 2023 when it came to the farm. And so with the drought and everything that happened, our expenses, we didn't make the money that we normally make on the homestead. Normally every project that we have at least breaks even on the homestead to at least pay for itself. And this last year was the first year that we were, not only did we go into the negative, we went way into the negative. I'll be the first to admit that we got some ground that we got to work on. And again, I think these pigs are a part of that process that's going to help us get back into the green in 2024. Knowing your pig type can greatly help you understand what you're needing out of that pig. So we carry two different types. So we have like our regular feeder hog and those Berkshire Landshire cross, I believe. 75% Berkshire, 25% Landshire, and those are 100% guinea hogs. Those are two completely different types of pigs. So you got our, our meat feeder hogs. And then we've got our lard hogs. And so those lard pigs are not going to be done in six months like our feeder hogs. Our feeder hogs should be well up to 200 pounds in six months through the summertime. We'll probably be to 175, I think, by the time we hit the, the six-month mark. But we're, they're growing to, at two different rates. Those lard pigs typically take a lot longer. You know, those American guinea hogs. Cooney coons is another one that you'll see on a lot of homesteads. We've done cooney coons. This is our first time at American guinea hogs. And just kind of understanding what each pig is going to naturally do helps us a lot. Those guinea hogs, for the most part, they eat the tops of the grass. They're great pasture hogs. They love to eat the tops of the grass and break things down. The Berkshires, you saw kind of what they do. They are nose into the ground. They are rooting everything up. And again, being a little bit more of an impact on the land. Cootie Coons, and from what I've seen from these guinea hogs, are a lot less land impactful. If you're looking to get into pigs and maybe want an easier start that's not going to turn your land into this immediately, there may be a great option. We had Cooney Coons that we kept over in our main barn along with the goats and the cows. And 
Never had issues with them. They stayed in the fence. They ate grass just like the goats. They had a great time. Uh, we enjoyed having them over there. Our frustration with those types of hogs, though, is that it could take 18 months to get them up to weight. 18 months is a long time. That's a long time to get something. The only thing I have that takes longer is the cow. Our cow's taken up to about three and a half years now to be sexually active to start breeding. But 18 months is a long time to keep up with an animal that's not giving you something immediately. Goats, you at least get, you can get milk and babies after about nine months to a year, so you could be selling off babies. But overall, it's a little bit different with these guinea hogs. They're not sexually active, nor can they be ready for meat for basically 15 to 18 months. So it's, it's a little bit more of a process than just having feeder pigs. Now, these feeder pigs, there's lots of different feeder pigs that are out there. Uh, these are the ones that I wanted to get into as a chef. I wanted a Berkshires. I've had great experience with Berkshires. I know a lot of people are going to talk to me about Duroc, and Duroc's the greatest. i got chef buddies who are all about Duroc, and Duroc is great. They're kind of like the Cornish hen of, of pork. And I mean that in that they're just bred to get really big really fast. But that doesn't always necessarily relate to flavor. And I'm here <laughs> for the flavor. I'm here. not just here for consumption. I'm here to produce the best ingredients possible. So it's important that we're setting ourselves up for success and uh, the expectations of our pigs. And the first time having those cooney coons, I admit, <laughs> I was just disappointed. And it wasn't, you know, Phil and Kay's fault. Phil and Kay, my two cooney coons, were great pigs. I actually miss them, as weird as that might be. They're fun creatures to have on the farm. They're shaking their, their butts and scratching themselves on the sides of walls. They're fun creatures to have around. And it was more of my inexperience than it was them actually doing anything wrong. Feeder hogs, you would typically not overwinter. There's people who can, you can more than welcome to do that. It might not necessarily be the cost might be too high to do that. We're overwintering from a perspective of I got these in October, I believe. So I got these in September or October and we're wintering them, but we're not breeding here. I'm not going to do the whole sow and whatever. I'm not doing all of that. I'm going to grow only for meat straight up, get in, get it done. Now, if you're having these cooney coons and guinea hogs that take 18 months to get to that point, it might be more profitable for you to breed on the farm. And there's things that kind of go along with that. They're a little bit more finicky than birthing a goat. Uh, we did have some cooney coons to be born here on the farm and did not go well for our first time. They laid over on top of them. The other one got eaten by the male. And again, it comes down to my and experience, not the pig. I got to set them up for success. That's my job as, as the homesteader and as the, the dominion of this land is to make sure that I set them up for success. So understand what you want to get into and what you want to stick away from. I have people uh, where I got the, all of these pigs from. They love breeding year-round. That's their thing, and that's awesome. I'm going to buy pigs from them every year. I've loved this. I plan on doing this more. But for me, I just have no desire to overwinter and house a sow and do the babies and do all this stuff and keep up with a boar and making sure that he's active and able to stay active. And there's a lot to it than just putting a male pig and a female pig in a room and letting them do something. It's not quite that simple. Please do your research on it. For me, it was just too much. It's not worth my time. I'm a full-time chef, and so my world is kind of out on the road. So I've got things going on. So sitting there and doing that whole process was just not worth it for me. Again, my name is Jonathan, and I'm super excited that you're here. This is you know, kind of a, a project that we have and focusing in on the ingredients. My background is farm the table, and this is kind of what I'm passionate about. I, I really hope you're here to enjoy the journey. If you are, make sure you hit the like and you hit the subscribe. I'm sure we'll do more than just homesteading videos. I'm a, an executive chef, and my world is about food. If I'm not getting the best ingredients, how can I put out the best food? And how do I get the best food? Well, growing it myself. So thank you again for joining us. Hit the like, hit the subscribe, and we'll see you next time. Oh, here we go. Donkey. You done? <laughs>